Hey everybody, this is a piece by Robert V. Daniels from the Soviet and Post-Soviet Review, for, uh, issue 20, numbers 2 to 3, or volume 20, numbers 2 to 3, uh, basically just 1993. Um, the piece is by Robert V. Daniels, Burlington, Vermont, USA, and the piece is titled was Stalin really a communist? Was Stalin really a communist? At first glance, the question may seem absurd, yet if one asks whether the Grand Inquisitor was really a Christian, the issue is immediately apparent. As with the Grand Inquisitor, the matter is not just semantic hair-splitting over the degree of difference that may have distinguished Stalin from the progenitors of the Bolshevik movement with which Stalin identified himself. Rather, it is the question whether the evil of Stalin and Stalinism flowed inexorably out of the essence of the mo that movement, or whether Stalin, or whether it was injected by a megalomanic, excuse me, megalomanic personality who, abetted by intractable circumstances, usurped the movement and turned it in an essentially different direction, albeit still dressed out in the language of its original nature. The problem of the man or the system has long lain at the heart of Western historiography of Stalin and Stalinism. With the revolution against Stalinism that culminated in 1991, the question has now acquired direct practical significance. What was the real nature of the regime that the Russians and other nations under Communist Party of Rule were actually rebelling against? And why op and what options and guidelines does the answer to this question leave the new successor governments as these new successor governments try to work out an alternative destiny? Anti-communists of the left, and like them, the proponents of perestroika in the Soviet Union have always seen Stalinism as a criminal betrayal of the revolution and of Marxist ideals already compromised by the excesses of Leninism. In this view, Stalin was able to seize the levers of power that had been set up by the Bolshevik Revolution and use those levers of power to alter the whole natural course of history in Stalin's own cruel and mendacious image. Stalin's attachment to Marxism and even to socialism then only served to camouflage the establishment of a new oriental despotism. The contrary argument that Stalin was basically a product of the communist movement can take either of two distinct approaches. One approach, the theory most favored now in Russia as well as outside Russia, is that Stalinism was inherent in the evils of Leninism or Marxism or of the Enlightenment. Stop where you will. The interpretation actually implies a sort of philosophical determinism contending that Stalin and Stalinism stemmed logically from utopian theories based on the conscious reconstruction of the world. In the words of the Russian political scientist Alexander Zipko, quote, Socialism is precisely that historically unique society that is consciously built on the basis of a theoretical plan, dot, dot, dot. The defects in the structure are not just due to Stalin's departure from the original blueprint for socialism, dot, dot, dot. The defects also represent departures of theoretical thinking from life, end quote. The lesson drawn by the adherents of this view is that any attempt to tinker with the status quo, any heretical notion of social engineering, will inevitably lead down the slippery slope to totalitarianism. The other approach linking Stalinism and the Bolshevik movement is less subjectivist than either the evil genius theory or the ideological theory. In this view, Stalinism emerged from the natural working out of the process of revolution against the background of Russian backwardness. Whether or not that outcome bore any relationship to the conscious intentions of the people who labored to set the process in motion, Stalin was thus a sort of Bonaparte or Hitler a la Luce, a de despot ready, willing and able to exploit the possibilities that the waning of real revolutionary spirit offered him. 
A realistic assessment of Stalin's place in history demands a combination of these diverse approaches. The revolutionary process leading from the collapse of the old regime through ineffective liberalism to radical fanaticism, and then to retrenchment and despotic synthesis of the new with the old, has a certain objective character. It represents the pressure of probability in social dynamics beyond the control of any individual and usually beyond the ken of those who think they are steering the process. Napoleon himself said, quote, a revolution can neither be made nor stopped, end quote. But individual leaders, their passions and ideas, their tactical judgments can give a great imp have a great impact on the actual shape of the revolutionary process in a given country. Lenin and Leninism certainly contributed to the harshness of the revolution in Russia. Even more distinctively, the con they contributed to the ability of the Communist Party organization and communist ideology steeled in the extremist phase of the revolution to hold sway through the succeeding phases of Thermidorian reaction and post-revolutionary or, quote, Bonapartist dictatorship. Stalin entered this picture as a decisive personality after Lenin's demise by taking command of the key instrument of power, the Communist Party apparatus, like Bonaparte with the Revolutionary Army, and thereby put himself in the position of a post-revolutionary dictator. This phase in the revolutionary process characteristically invites an opportunistic egomaniac to impose his will and his whims at the same time that he responds to the exigencies of the post-revolutionary situation by working out some sort of synthesis of revolutionary spirit and appearances with a revival of old-fashioned political methods and structures of rule. This is exactly what Stalin did when Stalin achieved unchallenged personal power in the late 1920s and drove home his own conception of socialism with the program of high-speed industrialization and forcible collectivization of the peasants. Socialism was the centerpiece of Stalin's synthesis. Stalin inherited a totalistic concept of state socialism from the Russian revolutionary movement, but everything Stalin did to shape it, in practice moved it closer to traditional czarist forms of bureaucratic centralism, militarized ethics, and office-holding elitism, the quote, new class, which, um, uh, never mind. Militarized ethics and office-holding elitism, the, quote, new class, all Marxist-Leninist mythology about, quote, communism, and the, quote, withering away of the state, notwithstanding. But its emphasis on production over justice, excuse me, with its emphasis on production over justice, Stalin's socialism was not the successor to capitalism, but an alternative to capitalism, an alternative found wanting when competition with capitalism brought the Soviet fate Soviet Union face-to-face -face with the more sophisticated requirements of the post-industrial age. Stalin's opportunity as a dictator was presented to him by the ebbing phase of the revolutionary process, as well as by Russia's particular problems of modernization and development, which is not to say that his answers were the only ones. Here Stalin's personality entered into it, first of all in his Machiavellian drive to amass power and destroy his old associates in the party leadership. These aims were central to his break in his break with the Bukharin group and his embrace of the radical economic line in 1928 to 29. This line was by no means the only answer to Russia's problems, but it was one that worked if pursued with the necessary single-mindedness. Once committed, Stalin showed himself capable of inhuman harshness in driving his program through. Was Stalin a fanatic, or as George Kennan has written, quote, a man of incredible criminality, end quote, or does it not make any difference at the extremes? Stalin was certainly adroit in manipulating Marxist-Leninist doctrine to justify his exploits. To his contemporaries, Stalin seemed to be little more than an opportunistic slogan monger. Quote, Stalin changed his theory according to whom he needs to get rid of, end quote observed Nikolai Bukharin, 
after Stalin broke with him in 1928. And Georg Lukács commented after Stalin's death, quote, Stalin's unscrupulousness in this matter reached the point of altering the theory itself if necessary, end quote. However, there is good reason to conclude that Stalin had to believe and compel everyone else to believe even as he proceeded with his diverse ideological maneuvers. Evidently, Stalin needed a sense of unconditional ideological legitimacy, conceivably rooted in his orthodox religious training, Regardless of how far he might depart in practice from the earlier spirit of the movement, this need, need for a bridge between rigid theory and widely, evol wild, excuse me, widely evolving practice, reversing the presumed dependence of practice on theory, led Stalin step by step to the totalitarian control of all realms of thought, culture, and political expression. But this was not enough for Stalin, more and more obviously warped, Stalin's more and more warped personality, which carried Stalin inexorably to the paranoid nightmare of the purges as well as to the el elicitation of obscene adulation of himself as history's greatest genius in every field of human endeavor. What we can appropriately designate the, quote, Stalin revolution from the late 1920s to the mid-1930s was thus the product both of the circumstances and the individual, of the process and the personality. Direct responsibility of Stalin's predecessors in the Bolshevik movement is less clear. If we bear in mind the manipulative approach Stalin took to their ideological legacy, to be sure, the tidal wave of fanaticism, violence, and moral devastation of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War clearly helped set the stage for Stalin's methods and provided Stalin with his essential instrument, the party apparatus. However, the further he progressed into his new revolution from above, the less can, he, can Stalin be linked to the Bolshevik heritage, apart from his use of the Marxist-Leninist vocabulary, and the more the Russian element in his synthesis stands out. Much of the confusion that still prevails about Stalin's historical role can be dispelled if we conceive of the Stalin Revolution in two phases, or perhaps view the Stalin Revolution as a revolution from above followed by a counter-revolution from above. The first phase, running from 1928 to about 1932, was the time of Stalin's, quote, cultural revolution, as some have called it, with a nod to Mao Zedong's radical renovation of the Chinese revolution in the 1960s. It was the time of Stalin's forcible reconstruction of the Soviet economic order and his imposition of totalitarian controls in all walks of life in an atmosphere of dogmatic Marxism and recharged class struggle against alleged enemies among the intelligentsia and the kulaks. This is the phase in the spirit by which he is mainly remembered. The second or counter-revolutionary phase of Stalin's violent reordering of so Soviet life is less clearly recognized. Beginning around 1932 and continuing to around 1936, Stalin systematically rejected most of the basic propositions of Marxism and most currents of revolutionary culture and social policy while clinging to the revolutionary language. This vast reversal proved relatively easy thanks to the monopoly of public communication and the principle of party authority on every conceivable question and that, that he had established in the first phase of his revolution from above. Thus, Stalin could still claim exclusive Marxist-Leninist rectitude and condemn all who defended earlier versions of the truth as counter-revolutionaries and enemies of the people. Behind this smokescreen, he abandoned the egalitarian, excuse me, equalitarian ideal, policy preferences for the proletariat, the primacy of economics over politics, the social explanation of individual deviancy, and the libertarian and experimental spirit in culture and education. Stalin turned to the principle of discipline in every realm from the factory to the family. Stalin embraced Russian nationalism, nationalistic history, and russification of the Soviet minorities. 
At the same time, Stalin prepared and launched a campaign against the old leadership of the Communist Party that is still hard to comprehend. It was war against the old Bolsheviks, distinguished by the show trials and forced confessions of his old rivals of the various communist opposition groups, and supplemented by the sweeping though unannounced purge of most of the people who had actually report supported him throughout his bid for power in the 1920s and during his revolution from above in the early 1930s. 30s. Khrushchev underscored this purge of the Stalinist excuse me. Khrushchev underscored this purge of the Stalinist in his Secret speech of 1956, citing statistics on the majority of Central Committee members and 17th Congress delegates who disappeared in the years of the terror. What Khrushchev didn't note was the clear age cutoff in the purge of the party apparatus. Everybody who was somebody over the age of 35, i.e. before born before 1902, and over 15 at the time of the revolution, with the exception of a few Stalin cronies and himself. The import of the Great Purge, like Stalin's reversals in social and cultural policy, has been obscured for the great majority of observers by Stalin's assiduous maintenance of ideological continuity. Labels aside, it was almost as much as revolu a revolution in the national leadership as 1917 was, or a rather a cultural, excuse me, or rather a counter-revolution. Stalin killed more communists than all the world's fascist dictators combined. In terms of the classic revolutionary process, Stalin went beyond Bonapartism. The ultimate effect of his counter-revolution was to bring the country on to the functional equivalent of an imperial restoration. One second. Copy that now. Fascism, like Stalinism, has come to power only after revolutions in Germany and Spain or near-revolutionary situations in Italy. Fascism, like Stalinism, has functioned as a post-revolutionary or anti-revolutionary dictatorship with the totalitarian methods characteristic of any post-revolutionary regime in the 20th century. <laughs> the differences lie in their overt ideologies and the route by which they came to power, as well as their approximation to the totalitarian, quote, ideal type. Stalinism emerged from a revolution of the left and adhered mendaciously to an ideology of the left. Fascism was avowedly anti-revolutionary and operated much more openly with its anti-democratic nationalist ideology. Thanks to both to its ideological needs and to its practice of Russian-style bureaucratic socialism, Stalinism became more truly totalitarian than any of its rivals on the right. Yet in the substance of their social policies and cultural norms, even extending to anti-Semitism, there is progressively less to distinguish the two systems after the Soviet U Russia entered the counter-revolutionary phase of Stalinism. In this perspective, the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939 was not, mu su mu not such an effort, not such an affront to the principles of each side as it appeared to be at the time. The great anomaly of the Russian Revolution embodied in Stalinism was the continuity of the Communist Party as an institution and the official attachment to Marxist-Leninist ideology through all the ups and downs of the revolutionary process. 
is this continuity that has so confused and distracted all too many students of the communist phenomenon, and even post-communist reformers in Russia, unable to clearly distinguish between the evolving Soviet reality and the continuous ideological illusion. To be sure, this institutional and ideological continuity was itself a product of Lenin's unusual merit as a revolutionary organizer to be able to put a political organization power in power where it could withstand 70 years of crisis, policy reversals, and leadership upheavals. The crucial point in the perspective of the revolutionary process was not Lenin's seizure of power in 1917, any fanatic could do that, but his ability to hang on through the Civil War and then to carry out his own Thermidorian reaction in 1921 instead of getting himself liquidated by the pragmatists like Robespierre was. From then on, the revolutionary qualities of the party were available to serve Stalin's post-revolutionary dictatorship and in fact to perpetuate totalitarian rule for another three decades after Stalin's death. This is how Soviet Russia came to experience the abnormal and dysfunctional prolongation of post-revolutionary dictatorship. How and why did all this finally come to an end? No revolution, or more precisely, no post-revolutionary dictatorship or restoration regime goes on forever. Sooner or later, some shock to the dictatorship allows the nation to return to its revolutionary origin in what I term the, quote, moderate revolutionary revival, end quote. Embracing revolutionary ideals in the Russian case, democracy, self-determination, and democratic socialism without extremist terror and violence. This is the direction of Soviet Russia's movement during the fall of the Khrushchev era, though unfortunately... Khrushchev did not give it consistent leadership, and the party apparatus was still too strong. The moderate revolutionary revival, when it should have taken place, was thus aborted. Consequently, the country had to endure another generation of anachronistic authoritarianism with its cynical pseudo-Marxist legitima legitimation, while economic advance was matched by moral decay. It was late in the day when the impasse in economic growth and generational change in the party dictatorship finally opened a real opportunity for the moderate revolutionary revival. This, of course, was the essence of perestroika as Gorbachev sought political and economic cures further and further back in Soviet history all the way to the morning after the October Revolution. However, the turn back proved to be an elemental process, particularly in the matter of national self-determination, that ultimately swept Gorbachev away and with him the last vestiges of the regime's attachment to the, quote, socialist choice of October. This left his successors with the task of finding new guideposts amid the rubble of Soviet history. Here, the historical definition of the communist experience became a matter of direct policy consequence. If Stalinism and Brezhnevism were seen as the logical implementation of the October Revolution and its, quote, socialist choice, a 70-year, quote, experiment, that any institution or policy associated with the label of, quote, socialism was to be rejected as the legacy of an era of criminal madness. If the system dismantled between 1985 and 1991 were seen to be the product of Stalin's post-revolutionary dictatorship and the, his disguised counter-revolution, then the Soviet experience before Stalin was left open as a source of possible policy guidance such as the Gorbachevians tried to find in the NEP. Since the fall of Gorbachev, this explanation of Stalinism has not been the perception of this choice of the successor leadership. Thus, short of a return to monarchism and Stalipin, no one mentions Kerensky. The new, new regime has been able to find no native inspiration at all. This self-imposed intellectual vacuum perhaps explains Russia's infatuation of the moment with the Western utopia of 19th century liberalism. Unfortunately, this infatuation has not averted the revenge of Russian political culture, is not ruled out drift in practice back toward the Russian habits and expectations of authoritarianism in which Stalin himself was nourished. R.V. Daniels, University of Vermont.